The idea that history is radically open, that anything can happen, upsets some people. You know, the idea that we could, yes, we could, this could be the beginning of the end of American democracy. We could be at the beginning of the end of American power. I mean, there are many negative scenarios you can you can project into the future. Um, but I but I wanted to tell readers that that there are positive scenarios as well, and that it's in their hands. Hey everybody, Miriam Williamson here. Thank you so much for being with me today. I read an article recently by a man named Matthew McWilliams, and he was talking about authoritarianism and democracy. And listen to this. He says, what I found is that approximately 18% of Americans are highly disposed to authoritarianism, according to their answers to four simple survey questions used by social scientists to estimate that disposition. A further 23% or so are just one step below them on the authoritarian scale. This roughly 40% of Americans tend to favor authority, obedience, and uniformity over freedom, independence, and diversity. I don't know about you, but I find that so scary, somewhat horrifying. What is happening? What is this ideal of democracy that so many Americans are willing to turn away from? What is it about an open society where everybody gets to think whatever they want to think and share what their opinion is and everybody gets it, nobody has a monopoly on truth and that there are diverse opinions and diverse ethnicities and diverse religions and diverse sex and sexuality? You know, to some of us, that's exciting, that that really is the ideal of America that makes this whole thing so amazing. To other people, that is what's scary. Some people like the simplicity of authoritarianism. No, this is how we're doing it, and this is who we are, and anybody who doesn't agree with that, what, doesn't belong here? This is, um, it's an amazing time, because it feels to me like this is the choice we're making as Americans. To some of us, the idea that we're all different, and we're different ethnicities, different religions, sexuality, color, culture... To some of us, and I would certainly include myself in this group, the fact that it's this huge mix is what's so exciting about the possibilities. Well, to some people, that's obviously what's so scary. And that is so much of the appeal of authoritarianism, that we will say how it has to be, and if people don't like it, then they either don't belong here or they need to shut up. What is the democratic vision And what is the authoritarian vision? Because I think that that is more than left versus right. That is the polarity that defines where we are now and where we're going. That which is a a genuinely democratic ideal versus that which is an authoritarian ideal. My guest today is a woman who's written quite a bit about this. And she writes about it within a historical context that I find um, uh, very helpful understanding how all this happened and also how this has been happening in other countries, not only before, but even now, as these authoritarian movements in places like Hungary and Poland and the Philippines and Turkey, there seems to be a bit of a authoritarian global virus. And what's happened in the United States with the Trumpism, etc., is part of this larger global movement. We have a lot to try to understand. We have to unpack this. We're not going to know what to do until we have much deeper understanding of what's already happening. So the book is called Twilight of Democracy, The Seductive Lore of Authoritarianism. Its author is Anne Applebaum. Um, I read the book with great interest. I read her articles with great interest. Um, This is a conversation so many of us need to have. There are just too many dots that we're not connecting. And I think the more we understand about what is a democracy, what is authoritarianism, how do democracies die, and how do authoritarian regimes rise up, every American needs to have a deep conversation about this. We need to understand what's going on, because we do need to decide where to go from here. Thank you so much, and a pleasure to meet you as well. Thank you. Uh, You're having a conversation in your books and in your articles that I think is so important right now. You know, I have worked with audiences uh, for many, many years. And one of the things uh, that I feel about Americans is that we're very good with a to-do list. Just tell us what to do and we'll do it. 
But we're living at a time in our history where it seems to me it's not as simple as what do we do. You make that clear in your books. You say there are no simple answers. It seems to me that right now it's not so much what do we need to do as what do we need to understand. And that's why I think uh, what you talk about is so important. I think it's very clear that millions of Americans are, are standing in absolute, just flummoxed by what is happening in our country. I think uh, that many people realize that our democracy is threatened. But I think a lot of people who might even appear to be apathetic are not apathetic, but almost paralyzed, including by fear. But it's a fear introduced by lack of information. One of the things you talk about in your book is what you call the, the myth of inevitability. Too many Americans grew up thinking, I think the image you use, it's like water in the tap. Of course the water's in the tap. Almost as though democracy is guaranteed, as though they don't even have to think about it. Now, I didn't grow up that way, uh, partly because I'm, I'm Jewish. I grew up in a household very aware that things can go wrong. But I think every American should grow up with far deeper understanding of what democracy is and why it needs to be tended to by every generation in its turn, as well as the dangers that occur when we don't do that tending. So could we start with your giving a little bit of basics of what democracy even is and, and the basic conversation about it? You have a lot to say about authoritarianism that I will certainly be asking you about, but you talk about democracy. You talk about the founders having referred to what happened in Rome and in Greece and Cicero, et cetera. So I'd love to hear you just let everybody know a little bit, what is this thing called democracy? So first of all, thank you for that, for that, for that question. That really goes to the heart of what my book is about and also what a lot of the things I've written about over the last um, couple of years have, have been about. I mean, look, the people who founded the United States of America never had any illusions about democracy. They didn't believe that everybody wanted to be democratic. They didn't believe that democracy was something that automatically worked. On the contrary, they lived in a world where democracy as we know it now didn't exist and they were inventing it from scratch um, or not entirely from scratch because what they were doing was they were reading ancient history. They were reading the history of Greece and Rome. Um, Cicero, who was a Roman writer who described the, the collapse of the Roman Republic and whose language, if, if you've ever got time to read him, is, is, is so modern. I mean, when you read Cicero, it's almost uh, like uh, reading. Stunningly so. Stunningly so. It's like, it's like he's describing things that are happening today. Um, and, <laughs> yeah, and then Cleopatra came for coffee. Right. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And in the 18th century, um, kind of popular versions of Cicero were circulating in the colonies. Um, Cicero and Cato, who was another Roman writer, um, there was a it was Cato. There was a famous play about Cato, the life of Cato, that was performed all the time. And in fact, George Washington had it performed for his troops. Um, even when they were camped at Valley Forge. So these ideas, you know, wow. that, that what we need to do is build a new version of the Roman Republic, but build safeguards into it to protect against tyranny, to protect against the rule of the mob, and to protect against the instincts that many people have to follow demagogues. This was very current at the time of America's founding. Um, the idea that democracy was fragile, that it needs special institutions. Um, and many of the institutions that they built, some of which you know, work more or less well today, and some of which seem obscure, were actually designed at the time for this reason. For, the, for this reason. So why do we have two houses of Congress? Why do we have separation of powers? Why does the, why can Congress control the president and, pre, you know, why are they all balanced by the, by the court system and especially by the Supreme Court? That's because the founders were very aware of the danger of having consolidated power. And so they wanted our institutions to be split up. And that's just one example um, of the way in which they, they were thinking constantly about the ways in which democracy might fall apart. Um, one of the things that's happened in the in the you know more than two centuries since then is that Americans have, and particularly since the Civil War, I would say, and even more so since the Second World War, is that Americans have become very used to success. You know that our democracy succeeds, that it has gone along with this increase in prosperity that has also been accompanied by this expansion of our global power and influence. And you know, as you said, you know, as I as I've written and as you pointed out. 
this has led to this feeling of inevitability. In other words, democracy is just something that Americans have automatically. It's automatically the best political system. Um, it's the thing that everybody wants, and there's nothing special that we have to do as citizens in order to maintain it or in order to have it. You know, there can be this special separate cast of politicians you know, somewhere over there, they worry about democracy and the rest of us can go on with whatever, making money or painting paintings or, um, you know, going shopping. And we don't have to think about democracy because that's what that's something that a special cast of political people or political leaders do. Um, but that was a mistake um, because the health of democracy and the success of democracy as our founders designed it and as it's worked out in other places really depends on um, m many people being involved and many people understanding what the basis of the system is. I mean, if you think about it, democracy is a very, it's almost inhuman or, or kind of, um, you know, it's, it, it demands of people something very extraordinary. In other words, it demands that, you know, when you win an election, that you preserve the playing field, the free press, the independent courts, the independent institutions, so that four years later, your enemies can win again. Um, it also demands that when you lose an election, you allow the ruling party to rule, um, and with the certainty or the assumption that they will preserve those institutions and that you can win again in four years' time. And nobody abuses the system, nobody takes advantage of it, nobody tries to twist it to prevent their opponents from winning again. Um, and of course, it's you know, in, in human nature to do this, um, but, de but, but democracy depends on this buy-in, it depends on this assumption that we are all following the rules and it depends on people knowing what the rules are. Um, and as we live in a society where fewer people know or fewer people care or fewer people are involved, um, you, you can begin to have the problem that, you know, the, the, you know, the, the rules aren't holding anymore. And that may be where we are now. It is, I think, very clearly where we are now. And there's a lot to unpack there. First of all, we have 11 states uh, in this country that don't even require half a year of American history, civics, or government. So a lot of these principles, you talk about these principles, these institutions, what are the basic principles of American, of Western liberalism, of democracy, of the basics of American society, even the fact that we have three, uh, uh, three separate branches, it's stunning how many people don't even know that. So I think that there's an educational factor there. Um, you talk about how it's inhuman. I think there's, it's also the point that it's something very human. You have to cultivate a relationship. You can't just get married and assume it's going to be okay. You have to cultivate it. You can't just establish a garden and assume it's going to be okay. You have to tend to it. And I think too many people, like you said, felt that it was legitimate to go, like you said, paint pictures or do whatever they wanted to do. Because also, as you said, this political class, that should have been a red flag right there. <laughs> was going to take care of it, which is op opposite of a democracy. And then you have the fact, of course, that people of color, uh, many people in this country have known for a very long time that democracy was not working for them. I think that um, a lot of people are just waking up to it because it's not working for us. But a lot of the problems that we have have been happening on the other side of town, and in many cases on the other side of the world, in ways uh, that we did not realize. And I think also... Everything that you just said also speaks to the fact that it, you have to have the bandwidth for democracy. Once you realize that this is going to take your participation, citizens have to be involved here. You know, when people are living in profound economic hardship, as so many tens of millions of Americans have, chronic stress uh, economically, when you, if you were to say to them, well, are you going to the city council meetings? <laughs> are you taking, you know, are you really aware of what your town, what is happening? They look at you like, what, are you kidding? I'm just trying to pay the guilt, uh, bills and get uh, my kids to school. There is a quote from the book that I want to mention because I think also this really speaks to the psychology of democracy versus the psychology of authoritarianism. You say, democracy itself has always been loud and raucous. But when its rules are followed, it eventually creates consensus. The modern debate does not. Instead, it inspires in some people the desire to forcibly silence the rest. I mean, look, this has been a problem with our democracy and with all democracies from 
you know, f- f- always. Um, and sometimes democracies break down, as ours did, for example, during the during the Civil War in the 19th century, um, precisely because it was impossible to hold very different visions of the country um, in everybody's head at the same time. Um, uh, you, uh, let me respond to two things that you said that are interesting. Um, one, when you talked about the black community and the and the and the the feeling that many black Americans have that they aren't participants in democracy or it's not working for them, um, I'm I'm extremely sympathetic to that. Um, although I would also point out that many of the greatest black leaders, if you look at if you listen if you read Frederick Douglass um, or if you read the Martin Luther King, the, the the words of Martin Luther King Jr., you know, his most famous speeches. Many of them looked back and harked back to the original words of the American founders um, and, sought to, and sought to make their case in the original ideas. And what they were able to do was to say, look, here are those original ideas. We aren't living up to them. We aren't holding ourselves up to them. We aren't, we aren't fulfilling the ideas. And actually, if you read about the abolitionists in the 19th century and the people who fought against slavery um, from the earliest days when it was actually a very um, original and difficult position or, or, um, you know, to, to, for, for, for people to hold or where it was not, was not common, most of them were converted, most Americans were converted to abolitionism by the language of the founders. Um, and, you know, the, that language of freedom, that aspiration to living in common, I mean, those are very strong um, and, and appealing ideas. So although I know I said a minute ago that um, democracy is very difficult and almost, you know, contrary to human nature in many ways, it is also true that the appeal of these ideas, you know, remains remains strong. Um, the second thing I would respond to is your um, this comment about um, noise and aggravation in modern life, because one of the things I talk about in the book, and it's also something I've written about in, you know, in The Atlantic and elsewhere, um, is the way in which modern conversation um, has gotten worse um, and has made it more difficult for us to find compromise. And there are a lot of different reasons for this. And, you know, you can talk about cable television and you can talk about um, almost the advertising model of media that demands that people be very loud and aggressive in order to be heard um, in a very raw, you know, in a very crowded market. Um, and of course, you can also talk about the nature of modern social media, um, which in effect sets the rules, at least for online conversation, and sets them in a way that really isn't conducive to compromise. Um, if you look at the way that Facebook's algorithm works, for example, you know, and that means the that's the computer program that determines what you see in your newsfeed. When you open Facebook, what information do you get? Um, that that the decision about what you see is taken by a set of rules that are written. As I said, it's a it's an algorithm. It's a computer program, and the rules favor emotion. They favor division. They favor outrage. Whatever it is that will keep you on your seat and looking at Facebook. So what Facebook is interested in is keeping you online, and 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 so that you will stay on their site, and so that you will look at advertising. Um, and the, that, that means that instead of the traditional ways of debating that we used to have, whether the parliamentary rules of procedure, whether the rules of a town hall, um, we are all operating in this new world where the rules about what gets heard and what's the loudest aren't necessarily the most rational commentary. It's not the most consensus-driven commentary. It's the loudest and angriest and most divisive commentary. Um, and I think, you know, and as I said, one of the one of the reactions that some people have to that is, I can't take this anymore. I want it all to shut down. Well, you brought up a couple of topics. About the second one, I couldn't agree with you more. Matt Taibbi's book, Hate, Inc., goes rather deeply into that, how Roger Ailes started a lot of that. Um, Crossfire, and of course, cable news, television, just as you were saying. But I think the first thing that you were saying is the one that's so interesting to me, because going back to what children are taught in school, that all men are created equal, 
that all men are given by God inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Martin Luther King was taught that in school. The suffragettes were taught that in school. The reason Frederick Douglass, the reason people hearken to that, because these were the, were the ideals upon which we agreed to agree. Too many Americans don't even know the things upon which we, apparent, we are supposed to agree to agree. And like you said, Martin Luther King said, we're not here to ask for new rights, we're here to cash a check. These were rights that were given to us. And I, I, not only do I agree with you, I see that issue as so, um, as, as so dangerously absent today. You know, I was once, I said to a friend of mine, I, w- I went into a school and the kids weren't, weren't uh, saying the Pledge of Allegiance. And uh, I said to the friend next to me, well, why aren't the kids saying the Pledge of Allegiance? And he erupted, because there is no damn liberty and justice for all. And I said, yes, but when I was a child, the fact that I put my hand over my heart, liberty and justice for all, and I pledged allegiance to that, is what turned me into a woman who gets very upset when I see it not happening. If we're not taught these these basic first principles, and this is why John Adams said that he hoped that every July 4th, America would visit our first principles. So I think, you know, and another issue I think, and there has to do with 20 years ago when STEM became so important in the schools. We started emphasizing so much teaching technology and engineering and math and science, and often that was at the expense of civics, at the expense of the humanities, and at the expense of history. People are not stupid, but just they were never taught really about the founders. They were not really taught about what those original ideals are. So one of the things you talk, I'm sorry, did you have something you want to say right no, there? No, I, I think that's very interesting. I also think there's another, you're, you're coming close to another issue that I find very interesting, which is the difference between nationalism and patriotism. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, America, you know, in, in a way, you know, we are so lucky that we have that language, that very radical language about equality as our founding ideal. Um, not all countries have that um, in, in their constitutions or in their in their sense of who they, they have are. Constitutions, um, or if they have constitutions, exactly, or if they have real constitutions. Um, mm-hmm. And you know, and it's important to remember that because, of course, there is some resistance in 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 among some in this country. I assume that was what was going on in the school that you visited. Um, where people are, you know, they don't want to honor the flag, they don't want to honor American history, um, and they're and 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 they may even be motivated by something understandable, which is this fear of nationalism, of chauvinism. Um, you know, our flag has been misused in the past. Um, our national language has been has been abused. Um, you know, the the language of America first or isolationism, you know, has been used to promote ugly ideas, just as national ideas have been used in ugly ways in other countries. Um, and it's really important that the American left, the American center, even the American center right, regain control over those patriotic ideas. I mean, these are ideas, the ideas that lie at the heart of what America is, should be should belong to all of us. And our patriotism should be about those ideas. It's not about some ethnic superiority. It's not because, you know, America has more nuclear weapons. It's not because, you know, we're big and we can beat up everybody else. You know, our national pride should lie in those ideas. And that's what, um, and the more, you know, we can discuss that and be taught that not just in school, but after school, um, the better off we'll be as a nation. Um, and and under understanding the value of that patriotism, that kind of patri- you know, civic patriotism, um, as opposed to nationalist chauvinism, xenophobia, um, is really important. So I'm, I'm glad you stressed that. And I think when it comes to patriotism, much like morality, uh, many on the left have acted like we were too cool to go there in much the way that you just said. Uh, we're too cool for that. We're too, uh, we're too sophisticated for that. We'll be very, very careful. Because if you're not having what I've seen with both morality and with patriotism, if you're not having, people are hardwired to want to go there. So if you're not having the genuine conversation, people are going to be lured into the ersatz version of that conversation. If, you, if you're going to just drop the flag on the floor, guess what? Somebody else is going to pick it up and it might not be somebody that you like which takes us to authoritarianism. And this is a quote you have about authoritarianism. Authoritarianism appeals simply to people who cannot tolerate complexity. 
There is nothing intrinsically left-wing or right-wing about this instinct at all. It is anti-pluralist. It is suspicious of people with different ideas. It is allergic to fierce debates. Whether those who have it ultimately derive their politics from Marxism or nationalism is irrelevant. It is a frame of mind, not a set of ideas. I think that is so profound right now because there's this fundamentalism on both left and right, which is really authoritarian in nature. So I'd love to hear from you, not only your thoughts about authoritarianism, but also you explain so much about how this is a global virus. And I think a lot of Americans, you really learn a lot. No, it's not just here. It's Hungary. It's Poland. It's Turkey. It's the Philippines. So would love for you to tell us something, not only about what's going on here, but also what's going on around the world. And what do you see as the relationship between the two? So one of the reasons, if I was slightly ahead of the curve, which I think I was um, in 2014 and 15, about the danger of um, disinformation but and sort of authoritarian rhetoric in the United States, it's because I've spent a lot of the last decade, two decades really, living in Eastern Europe. Um, I'm mm -hmm. my, It's a long story. My husband is Polish. I've lived on and off in Poland for almost 30 years, actually. Um, I have a, you know, my only actual house that I own is in the Polish countryside. Um, and I have, you know, I've and I've watched the transformation of that country and indeed of the whole region um, over the past several decades. Um, and one and some of the things that have happened in the United States happened there slightly earlier. There are some ways in which we resemble other places. Um, and the kinds of the, the, the way in which modern media, social social media, but as well as broadcast media began to create deep polarization, um, the way in which, a part of what had been the center right became radicalized and began moving towards the far right. Um, some of those trends were things that I saw earlier, um, you know, in again in Poland and in in in, in Eastern Europe, and then I saw them in, happening in a very similar way um, in the United States. Um, and this is something that I often find I have trouble convincing Americans of, you know, that really it's actually not that different, you know, what's happening in Poland and what's happening in the United States. But, but there are a lot of commonalities. Um, and I think the, if, you look, if you look at some of these different countries and you look at what's happened um, over the, particularly over the last several years, the, the thing that holds, um, that holds these very you know, different kinds of people to, and movements together, these, you know, whether it's the Polish far right or even the French far right or um, a, a part of the Brexit movement in Britain, which was also a nationalist movement, um, and you know, and a, and a part of the you know the sort of the, the Trumpist part of the Republican Party, what holds a lot of them together is this very profound disappointment, um, this feeling that um, you know their country isn't what they thought it would be, um, that you know demographic change has create has has made it very different from what they remember as a child. Um, sometimes it's to do with their personal lives. Um, how they they are personally disappointed and they see a political opportunity in a new political party or movement. Um, you know, I didn't exceed, you know, they didn't succeed in the mainstream or the centrist press and they see a room, a, a space for themselves on the far right. But this kind of disappointment, this kind of radical disappointment is the thing that we've seen over history. I mean, my first several books were about Soviet communism. So again, a completely different time and place. Um, but if you look at, you know, if you look at the history of the Bolshevik Revolution, if you look at other radical movements in, you know, in the last couple of hundred years, they almost always start with this sense of disgust or disdain or disappointment with existing institutions. Um, and when I began to see that in the U.S., um, you know, this feeling that, you know, this disdain for the media, disdain for the courts, disdain for democracy, disdain for political opponents, um, when I heard the way, for example, that Trump began to speak about his opponents as, you know, enemies of the people or as, uh, you know, the, 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 the kinds of language that he used about congressmen and women of the opposite political party, you know, when I heard that kind of talk, um, that was when I realized that American democracy was in trouble because that is the kind of language that authoritarians have used all over the world. It's when, it's when they can, you know... Um, push and promote this disappointment, you know, the, this, this sense that our system isn't working, that our opponents can be held in contempt, 
um, and that the rules of democracy don't really apply because they don't really work. It's this very deep cynicism about politics, um, I think, that that has led that has led to, democ- to, to authoritarianism in so many places. Um, and the pattern is pattern is amazingly similar in different places. Yeah. I don't know if you would agree with me about this. I think a large part of that started with Reagan showing such disdain for government. People, the way he said, you know, government, the most terrifying words are the government is here to help you. The trouble with making it, that was one part of what Reagan said. Um, Another part of what Reagan said, if you read some of his speeches, I recently reread one that he gave. It was a famous speech he gave in in Britain um, at the at the House uh, House of Commons. Um, he also had a way of speaking about freedom and liberty um, that were appealing to people all over the world, and that actually inspired a lot of people, even in the United States, to think broadly and deeply about foreign countries, how they could help Democrats abroad. Um, and I think what happened in the Republican Party, and particularly in the sort of Cold Warrior piece of it, was that you had these, two, you know, it's almost as if you had these two possibilities. You know, there were these, there were these different strands in Reaganism. You know, Reaganism, like all political movements in the United States, was a coalition. Um, and one of the things that happened after the Cold War was that coalition broke up. Um, and so, whereas, um, you know, the I don't know Reagan Cold Warriors in the 1980s, you might say, well, there were some who were in it for realpolitik reasons, some were believed in democracy and human rights, some were there because they were religious and they believed Marxism really. That that coalition broke up in the 90s um, and began to go in different directions. And that really was when um, when the Republican Party began, part of the Republican Party began going off in this other direction. Um, and it's always important to look at what might have been. Um, the party didn't have to make those choices. You know, it didn't have to be led by the people it was led by. Um, and it's you know, it, and, and the reason I'm saying this is because it's still my hope that the Republican Party or some future version of it will look back on its history and it will rediscover the more open-minded, um, the more generous, um, the you know the, the the you know the more democratic tradition that it also has in its past, and that it will you know that it will it will overcome the current Trumpist movement and recover something different. I hope that the Republican Party will reclaim its soul, just like I hope that the Democratic Party will reclaim its soul and its spine. But I think I have a slightly less romantic view of of the Reagan years. I agree with you that he was a mixed bag. And I agree with you that his words and his sentiments about freedom and liberty not only were very compelling for Americans, but also based on something true. But what that conversation skips is the fact that he financialized everything. He not only showed the disdain for government, but also this exaltation of corporate America and the bottom line of corporations through privatization and deregulation that really, despite the jargon, really put corporations ahead of the safety and the well-being of people and and planets. So um, I, I hear what you're saying, but to me, there's a big and there. Not a but, but also a big I don't disagree with you, although I would say that it was, a, I don't entirely disagree with you, although I would say that it was something wider than just Reagan. Um, there was a, you know, there was a feeling that we can do things more efficiently. There's a feeling that if we can put numbers on public policy, we can run it better. Um, there were, and that was a, those were, those were instincts that you found on the right as well as the center left. Um, and it may be that we pushed it too far. There was actually a massive transfer of wealth into the hands of a small group of people, the stockholders, at the expense of other stakeholders, and those people knew what they were doing. And uh, well, you can talk about how much Reagan was just a puppet of them, but they knew what they were doing, and I don't believe they were just doing it to be uh, more competent, except for anyone other than themselves and their children. But that, that's a slightly different issue. Now, you have written so much and talked so much about what happened in Hungary, what happened in in the Philippines, what happened in Poland, what happened in other places where this authoritarian virus took hold. You talked already here about the psychology, the personal grievances, what makes individual citizens more vulnerable to that. What, what, What are the attributes of the authoritarian leader? that makes them so good at harnessing all that poison? Probably the most important feature that an authoritarian lead, that authoritarian leaders around the world have in common is very profound cynicism. 
um, yeah. about their own institutions, and as you've said, a willingness to undermine them. Um, you know, look at how democracies fall nowadays. Um, we all have in our minds an image of, you know, a coup d'etat, you know, that democracy ends with some kind of violent eruption. You know, there are tanks on the street, there are, you know, men with guns, there are people in uniforms, they swarm around the White House. I mean, we all had a, we all have a kind of cliche vision of what it would look like if America were somehow taken over by an autocratic power. Actually, that's not how most democracies now fall, and that's not what most um, would-be authoritarian leaders do nowadays. Um, what they do instead is begin an assault, particularly in, in initially, on those institutions that can produce accurate information and can, can, can provide checks and balances to what they do. So whether it's the independence of the press, which is much harder to, to affect in America, but is much easier to destroy in some smaller countries, whether it's the government bureaucracy, which can keep track of, of what people do and, and can, um, you know, and can provide checks and balances, you know, inspectors general and others who are meant to be keeping track of and stopping corruption, um, whether it's courts undermining the political independence of courts, you know, when you don't have that, um, you have, you know, you, you, it's much easier for them to, for, for, for even elected leaders to get away with corruption or to get away with other kinds of damage. And the, and the countries that have ceased to be democracy are those that have, um, where leaders have successfully undermined first, usually norms and, and habits and ways of doing things. And this we did see in the Trump administration. Um, and then later on, you know, dismantling anything that could check their own power. Um, and this is what, you know, and this is what Trump did in, in some cases. I mean, in his case, I think we were in some ways lucky with Trump in that I don't think he understood the American government well enough to dismantle it as thoroughly as it could have been dismantled. Um, and one of the if things he I wanted to completely, yeah. Had he wanted to completely do it. And I worry about, one of the things I'm most worried about is a future Trump style leader of the Republican Party who's more intelligent or at least better informed than he was. He was somebody who was very ignorant of, of government and how it worked. And so he, towards the end, you could see him beginning to get his hands on the levers of things. I mean, one of the most frightening things that happened in the Trump administration is something that we didn't pay much attention to because it was the very end, which is when he suddenly replaced many um, political appointees at the Pentagon That's um, right. in the very last weeks that he was in office. And to this day, I don't think it's been clarified why exactly he did that. And um, one of the possible explanations is that because he was planning this assault on the Capitol, um, because he was planning to try and stop the, um, the, the, the formal naming of Joe Biden as president, he may have had in his head the idea that he could use the Pentagon or he could use the military to do that. Um, I think, fortunately, the, the Pentagon leadership was very bent, very um, clear that that was not going to happen, um, you know, and, and, and we and we had generals in place who, who would not have, even if that, you know, even had that begun to work, which it seems as if it didn't, who would not have gone along with that. You know, what if there were some future Republican administration or even another political party administration who, um, who you know, who, who, who were clever about it? What if there was a future president who named his own generals and named his own political appointees and, 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 and did, did even more damage? Um, but when you look, you know, as I was saying, when you, when you look around the world and you look at those who've been successful, it's those who have been the most systematic at undermining these institutions, all the ones that are meant to preserve the balance of power, that are meant to provide checks and balances, and that are meant to provide the independent um, information that citizens need to make judgments about who should be their leader. Um, and that's also one of the reasons why I'm hoping that Merrick Garland will actually start prosecuting some people. Because there are some people who would be in the category you're talking about, who I can't imagine being deterred by anything short of a fear of serious jail time. And if they are not afraid of serious jail time, I'm afraid they're going to spend the next four years figuring out to, how to do exactly what you mentioned. In the end, you know, you're, you say, look, there are no easy answers. And obviously that's true. And, but the hope that I got from your book and from your writing is that you do say, and it's, I love this phrase, that history is radically open. 
And that, that gives me hope, and I think it should give all of us hope, that we are still at choice, that this is not inevitable. You make a point in your writing. Look, democracy is not guaranteed, okay? It, and stop this magical thinking that democracy is guaranteed. But also the continuation of an authoritarian trajectory is not guaranteed either. So uh, in conclusion, I suppose, I would just love to hear you um, Say a little more about that and what your own hopes might be for the radical openness of history at this time and what you do see as, I know not as the silver bullet because you make it clear there isn't one, but what do you see as the signs that you look at and you go, well, that's hopeful, that's hopeful, the things that might point to the radical openness of history that could turn things away from an authoritarian trajectory in this country. It's funny, you know, some people have interpreted the end of my book when I talk about this as, a, as, a, as pessimistic. Um, and some have interpreted it as optimistic, but, but but I think this is because this is because we've all become so unused to living with the idea of uncertainty. You know, we live in a culture where there's so much is safe and so much is secure, and we have, you know, you know, for all of the very problems of modern life, you know, it's 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 much more predictable than life used to be. You know, a hundred years ago. Um, and the idea that history is radically open, that anything can happen, upsets some people. You know, the idea that we could, yes, we could, this could be the beginning of the end of American democracy. We could be at the, at the beginning of the end of American power. I mean, there are many negative scenarios you can, you can project into the future. Um, but, I, but I wanted to tell readers that, that there are positive scenarios as well and that it's in their hands. Um, and this is, of course, almost for some people, it's a scary idea. You know, what we do, the decisions that we make, the choices that all of us make, the whether we decide to work as poll watchers for this election or that one, whether we decide to join a political campaign or a demonstration or a march, whether we teach our children about how our constitution is meant to work, um, whether we make everybody memorize the Gettysburg Address as I was made to do in school and maybe maybe children aren't made to do now. So all these small decisions, all these things that we do, these will shape the America in, in, in the years to come. And that's, and that's scary for some people in that there's no guarantee that we will succeed, but it's also positive in that I, what, I, what I hope it will do is inspire people to, 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 to apply themselves to democracy, to involve themselves in their own communities, to think about what they can do and what their children can do. Um, I also ended the book, I, it's a book that begins and ends with a party, and this is not because I'm very good at giving parties or, um, but just because I found that parties are a good metaphor. You have a group of people um, and, and they're, you know, they seem to be going one direction or another at a particular moment in time. Um, and the party that I ended with was a very optimistic one, of course, pre-pandemic, but it was a, just a summer um, party that I had at my house. And there were a lot of young people there. There were a lot of people in their 20s. Um, they were, some were, some were Polish, some were American, some were from, from other parts of Europe. Um, and what I, you know, when I meet them and when I speak to them, I, I found this incredible energy and this desire to do more. And so many of them are interested in careers in which they help create something or shape something. And they want to be involved in politics, um, you know, or even if they're not doing political jobs, they're interested in politics and they understand how, they seem to understand how it, how it relates to their lives. And I, I find with younger people, um, maybe because of this moment of crisis, maybe the experience of Trumpism, maybe the experience of the Black Lives Matter marches last summer, um, you know, the, the sense that we're living in a moment of great political turbulence, I think, has awakened the desire to be part of public life um, in a lot of younger people. And that's if I ha if I do have any hope and optimism, it's really there. Um, uh, you know, because they're the ones who inherit our country, and they're the ones who will ultimately decide what kind of a country it becomes. And I. Uh, I, myself, I see a lot of really good signs in this younger generation, and I, I have a lot of hope in what they'll be able to do. I agree with you entirely that uh, the young people of this generation, like the young people of my own and of many generations, do have that yearning, that fervor, because as, as we're, we know, this is their future. I thank you so much because, uh, as I said before, I think what you explain is so much a part of it. I see so many people who just kind of looking around, they know there's a problem. They don't know what to do. 
and they, they, they don't remember either what they learned in the seventh grade or they never learned it. So I think you're one of the great wise women, Anna Applebaum. I so appreciate your writing, and I so, uh, I'm so grateful that you come on and talk to us and uh, know that I'm one of those, uh, as many people are, who will always be reading what you have to say, appreciating greatly what you contribute, and thank you so much for being here with me. Thank you so much, and thank you for that wonderful plea for, for history, um, for people to read history and to know the history of our country. Um, why are things the way that they are? Because of what happened in the past. Um, and knowing that, I think, can help us a lot moving forward. Thank you again. Thank you for explaining it to us. All my best. Bye-bye. So, everyone, I hope that you feel, as I did, that Anne Applebaum has a lot to teach us. Her books, her articles, um, everything that she talks about in terms of where we are in this country, where we have been, and where we are going is um, very deep, very important, very significant, and something that all of us can learn from. Okay, now I have a question I'm going to answer, something that uh, I have thought about quite a bit myself. Uh, This is from Emily in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. She says, Dear Marianne, I've been thinking a lot about Donald Trump. And on one hand, part of me is so happy he's gone, I don't ever want to have to think about him again. But on another uh, hand, I part of me wonders, shouldn't people who commit a crime be held accountable? Please share your thoughts. Well, first of all, Emily, in in the United States, we are innocent until proven guilty. So we shouldn't just jump to this assumption that, uh, in legal terms, uh, Trump committed a crime. However, many of us have serious concerns that he might have done so, to say the least. And not only uh, Trump, but also many of the people around him. Let's give some historical perspective to this. After Watergate, I think a lot of people perhaps don't remember or don't realize that quite a few people in the Nixon administration did go to jail. Haldeman went to jail. Mitchell went to jail. He was the attorney general at the time. Ehrlichman went to jail. But when it came to Nixon himself, then President Ford said that he wanted this long nightmare to be over. He didn't want the country to have to go through the trauma of a trial. And so he gave Nixon a pardon. I give uh, Ford a benefit of the doubt and where I think he was coming from in his heart. I really think he felt that in order to move forward, they just needed to be done with it. But I think it did not serve this country because justice has an ameliorative effect. Justice is important. Justice is how we reconcile with a situation. And also, as I mentioned in the interview with Anne, I think that there are people whose ideas are just as um, Maleficent as Donald Trump's, who are spending their time right now figuring out how to get us back onto that authoritarian trajectory, which is obviously alive and well in the country, but they want to get it back into the White House. And I think only uh, the fear of serious jail time would possibly deter them. So I hope very much that Merrick Garland is looking deep into uh, into the behavior of Donald Trump and many of his cohorts, including Stephen Miller. I know that the Attorney General of New York is obviously uh, deeply investigating the financial issues, but in terms of the political issues, uh, so many of the policies, such as the separation of children from their parents at the border, the infliction of that kind of trauma on a child, that's child abuse in my mind taking a child away from their parents, particularly when, as they admit, it was a deliberate policy in order to deter people from coming here. That's kidnapping. And if the state does it, that doesn't make it less of a crime. That's just state-sponsored crime. Do I hope that these things are looked into? Do I hope that they are investigated by Merrick Garland and the Department of Justice? Absolutely, I do. Um, We need to know if any... um, if any crimes were committed, and if they were committed, then we need to see that people will be held accountable for those crimes. Thank you very, very much, everybody. I want to thank all the people who make the podcast possible. Thank you, Amanda Elliott. Thank you, uh, Austin uh, Kendrick. Thank you, Lauren Selsky. Thank you, Wendy Zoller. Thank you, all of the people at CAST. And I hope all of you who listened have a wonderful week. I hope that this was a good time for you listening to what we talked about today. And until we meet again, I wish you my very best. Thanks.